in the lane, 15, 10, touchdown, Chargers! Welcome to Chargers Weekly, a new man at the wheel for this week as our man Chris Harry, uh, a bit tied up, so we figured we would lean on one of the experts, he is expert in field was with us while we were out at the Combine in Indianapolis, and as we do a Combine wrap today, uh, Lance Erline, super, super cool of you to spend some time with us to kind of talk about all these prospects as we get ready for the 2024 draft post-Combine, if anything changed, how much it changed. For those of you that, that subscribe and listen to Chargers Weekly, you heard about a 20-minute conversation we had with Lance. It was one of our favorites while we were there, so we figured we would invite him back, and he was kind enough to accept. So, Lance, thanks so much. We appreciate it. Yeah, it's uh, I enjoyed it last time, so look forward to kind of recapping the combine what uh did anything change like if you could just in generality <clears throat> as we as we kind of you know pull out and take the the wide angle view did you feel like anything changed coming out of the combine that maybe you had originally thought about it going in um you know there's some there's some slotting yeah for me how i slot players is a little bit um it's a little bit fluid headed into the the combine and and I start to tighten it up a little bit after that. I, I moved J.J. McCarthy ahead of Bo Nix. And I, I like Bo Nix's season. I thought he had a good season. But, you know, honestly, Money, being on the, being on the field of the combine, I didn't, I didn't love the arm of Bo Nix. I thought I was going to – I thought I was going to get more, quite frankly. And yeah. it was just kind of an average arm. And when I start piecing everything together, I think, okay, he's going to need to be more of a system quarterback where – he has to stay inside the system, even though he's got some mobility and throws well on the move. And so now that kind of, and it combined with J.J. McCarthy, just kind of his, you could really feel that there's an energy between him and some of the wide receivers that you could feel. And that's not a small thing because when it comes to um, NFL receivers and, and, and players, they need to have a trust in a young quarterback. They need to, you know, they need to believe in the personality, believe in the guy's confidence. And I think J.J. McCarthy just has some of that. And so, you know, that's a small thing. I moved McCarthy from from five to four, from Knicks from four to five. But also I think Michael Penix has really created some conversation there at the back end of the first. Uh, typically, I think you'd look at Penix as a second-round player. But getting that fifth year is maybe even more important for a player who's going to be 25 years old uh, right. as a rookie. So let me um let me jump in there real quick, Lance, because yeah. just your evaluation of those two players leads me to to ask this. The Chargers have pick five in the first round, pick thirty-seven in the second round. So the fifth pick in each of those spots. Um thoughts on the likelihood that someone would would be willing to trade up to number five for McCarthy and then you know how it goes on day two when those quarterbacks maybe don't go at the back end of number one. Now you've got a bit of a frenzy to try yeah. to get up there for for Knicks, for Penix. Could you see each of those picks being in play for for that trio of quarterbacks? Well, I think, I think I've think i felt this from the first time I did a mock draft. I could really figure out here, like, okay, the Chargers are going to be the most valued spot from a trade-up standpoint. I think I think uh, Harbaugh and that, that entire front office is looking at really a very favorable situation because – if you lock in on offensive line, there's several offensive tackles that you may like. Um, I think that Fuaga, Fautuana, uh, uh, I, I would say Joe Alt and J.C. Latham should all be in consideration for the Chargers if they want to look at offensive tackle. And listen, based on how wide receivers could go, based on the way that the quarterbacks could go and should go, I think it's a great trade back spot. As a matter of fact, I'm doing everything I can to move back if, in fact, you want an offensive tackle because I think that the value you get from moving back and still picking a player that may potentially be first on your board at the offensive line spot is just too great not to trade back. So, yeah, I think I think because the Giants are going to be a team that, that they'll, they'll try to stay quiet about the quarterback position, but the fact is if they're not able to move up, that spot right in front of them is, a, is going to be a coveted spot, and that's why I think that the Chargers are sitting in a tremendous position at number five. So, yeah, I, I think that one money more than anything. Now, the second round is trickier just because, as you mentioned, people regroup after the right. first round. And so typically pick number 33 and 34 
and maybe even 35 are going to be the ones that I right. think could be the quarterback spots. The, um, you know, the, we, we've been focused so much on these two positions, Lance, really three, if you put Brock Bowers in it, right? It's sort of been, is it a Dunze or neighbors, or is it alt or Latham or Fashanu, whichever one, you know, whatever your, your preference may be. But it seemed like a lot of people came out of, of the combine and said, you know what? We kind of forgot about defense. We, we, we maybe forgot about defense a little bit because these prospects are so impressive and Dallas Turner puts on a show. And even though Terry and Arnold didn't run fast, he looked really fluid in all the drills. Quinion Mitchell throws up 225, 20 times and, and runs a blazing fast 40 time. What about, let's just say edge and particularly I think Turner and, and corner knowing that those are also positions of need, like in terms of your grading, how close are, let's just get, let's go with those three names, Mitchell, Arnold at corner and Turner at edge. How close would they be to one of those offensive tackles if they trade back to eight or 11? You know, it's funny. Um, I think if you trade back to 11, you may, there's a chance you could miss out on, on Turner now. Uh, Dallas Turner, his workout was phenomenal. As you know, money did some, yeah. I don't know if it's considered historical stuff, but we're talking about a seven foot wingspan and a guy who jumped over 40 inches, um, ran a sub four, five forty. Like he did some truly freaky things. And I've got a six, seven Oh grade on him to give you an idea running it backwards. I've got, I've got chop Robinson who I project as a really good NFL pro, but he's not ready yet, but I'm still giving him a projection grade. But then it goes Turner, then Latham, then Brock Bowers, then Jaden Daniels, Jared Verse, Roma Dunze, Caleb Williams, Marvin Harrison Jr., and Malik Neighbors for me. So, so you got you Turner ask, ahead of those guys. What's that? You got Turner ahead of those guys. I've got Tur no, Turner. No, Turner, I was working in reverse order. Oh, I got you. Working yeah, backwards. so Dallas Turner you. I've got right now is a ninth-rated right. prospect, tied, tied for ninth. But basically um, – I think that if you're going to move back, the positions you're probably going to be looking at are going to be offensive tackle. Terry and Arnold, that might be the first spot that a, a cornerback goes, either Arnold or Quinion Mitchell. Uh, I I talked to one team who thought that there was a chance that the cornerbacks could fall a little bit beyond pick number 12 or 13, and he thought the pass rushers, the quarterbacks, the wide receivers, and the tackles, that that was going to be – you know, a heavy, a heavy peppering of those positions. He also thought in mentioning Brock Bowers, I have a hard time placing Brock Bowers in a mock draft because, you know, he's, he's not a classic wide tight end. He's a, he's a very good run after catch tight end. He doesn't have great size. Um, he's going to test well at his pro day when he tests, he'll run fast, he'll jump high, but it's hard to place Brock Bowers because tight ends have become very, very difficult based on, what they make, what they're, you know, what they're, what they make, what their second contract is, um, how you're going to use them. But the team I talked to who I think could look at a tight end said, look, we think he's going inside the top 10 picks because he's wow. just kind of a special talent. And, but when I, when I go through the list money, it's hard for me to find, I think the chargers would be a great fit, but not at five. If right. you trade back, you open the door to Bowers, to wide receiver, to corner, to defensive end, like I'm trying everything I can to find the Chargers to trade back. I really, am. you know, it's interesting because I I think about tight end, and and this is sort of something that that we're dealing with in a lot of the comments and a lot of the pushback because people want they want the wide receiver. You know, I get it. It's fireworks. It's Justin Herbert. You think about all oh, the magic that they could make. It could be Jamar Chase, Joe Burrow esque, or Tua Tyreek Hill esque. But I just look at the history of Jim Harbaugh and and I look at how much success he's had he's won everywhere he's been and if I just go through like if I just go through his history right the wide receivers aren't putting up giant numbers like yeah. Michigan he's got Nico Collins and this year he'll have Roman Wilson you compare that to Mozzie Smith, Aiden Hutchinson, Daxton Hill, David Ajabo, Quiddy Pay, Cesar Ruiz, Ben Bredesen. Like, he's putting no linemen. He's putting D linemen. He's putting, you know, at Stanford, think about all the tight ends that he put into the league and Kobe Fleener and Zach Ertz and all these guys. Like, it's like, hey, man, this is what Harbaugh does, right? Are, are, am I missing something there? Because at the 49ers, his, his number one receiver was Michael Crabtree. He might have been a top 25 receiver in the league when he was with the 49ers, and the yeah. guy went to back-to-back -back NFC Championship games in a Super Bowl. No, and, and, and you're not wrong. And since I've been doing this, uh, for the NFL at least, since 2015, he's had three tight ends drafted. Luke Schoonmaker, who I liked a lot last year, was a second rounder. He had Zach Gentry drafted in the fifth round in 2019. 
And then in 2017, he had Jake Butt, but you remember Butt was coming off oh, an yeah. injury, so it was, he was never the same player he was pre-injury. But no, I think uh, in, in Stanford, you mentioned ones from Stanford who are even, I'd say, better than the ones I just mentioned. The tight end is a big part. Now, <clears throat> the one thing that's interesting, though, is his tight ends typically are going to be blockers as well. Right. And I think Brock Bowers will, will give you effort, but he's not going to be as good a blocker as most of the ones you mentioned. So he would have to step out a little bit on that one. But I don't think the offense that I, I think Jim Harbaugh is going to have to do a little bit more offensively. He's going to have to open up how he utilizes uh, pass catcher and how he diversifies his offense. But listen, the Chargers are a great team to talk about, you know, from a historical standpoint with Antonio Gates. You had Phillip Rivers and Antonio Gates and, a, and, a, and an amalgamation of different wide receivers over the years. What Tony Gonzalez did for two different teams as a big-time wide receiver, Rob Gronkowski, there was not a great outside receiver for most of the times that Tom Brady was there, but Gronk was a, was a huge factor. Like Travis Kelsey, same thing right now in Kansas City. You look at tight ends, and you have to think about them as a pass catcher. You can't label them tight end. They're pass catchers. And you right. make a really good point that you don't have to, you can get excited about wide receivers all you want, but the fact is they're going to be guarded by cornerbacks. You get a good tight end, and they can mismatch players. They can mismatch safeties. They can mismatch linebackers. If you go too small on them, then they have a size advantage. If you go too slow, they have a speed advantage. So Brock Bowers is a mismatch talent where, you know, the third wide receiver, Roma Dunze, for example, if he's the one on the board, neighbors is a speed mismatch. But I just I think it's a unique opportunity when you have a tight end who is the best, clearly, in the class. He just does things that other guys can't do, and he makes it harder to match up with you if you're the Chargers. What about if it let's just say that they think it's too rich because you hear about the finances and look, if you stick at five, it's yeah, it's hard to pick a tight end. You're talking about a four year commitment for 34 million bucks. You know, Brock Bowers immediately becomes one of the five highest paid tight ends in the league on his rookie contract. And you're trying to extract value from that. You pay an offensive tackle an average of, you know, 8.75 million bucks for the first four years, then you're feeling pretty good about that. Same with the wide receiver. Tight end is where they start to talk about, but a trade back situation with Bowers makes sense. But what about Lance the Gap? Because we talk about Travis Kelsey and George Kittle and all, Sam Laporta in the second round. If you were to wait, it seemed like the one name, well, two names that kind of came out of, of the combine were beyond Bowers were Jatavian Sanders and Theo Johnson. Um, just kind of thoughts on the tight end. It felt like people felt a little bit better about the tight end class coming out of Indy than going in because last year's class was just so historic when it came to pass yeah. catchers. Yeah. You, if you wanted tight end, you should have got one last year. I think right. this year, you know, for me, Theo Johnson is right now a little bit better tester than he is a player. Uh, you see flashes when he plays, but honestly, Warren, the tight end who went back to to Penn State was the guy that I thought would be an early second rounder, probably the second tight end in this class. Uh, Jatavion Sanders, I got to be honest, Money, I, I don't care what he ran. He plays fast. Yeah. Um, he assaults defenses down the seam. He is a big-time three-level weapon. I think when you looked at the speed of Xavier Worthy and A.D. Mitchell in Texas, and you kind of get lost in the fact that, that Quinn Ewers, frankly, should have found Jatavion Sanders even more because this guy really was a matchup issue. He makes contested catches. He's not much of a blocker. Now, It's I think it's more of an effort thing. He has the size, and you see he has the strength. He has the physical capability to be a better blocker, but the effort level needs to improve. But as a pass catcher, I think he is a tremendous weapon as a pass catcher. I think he would be a guy who could really, uh, to me, unlock – the potential of the passing game and might be something and frankly might be something that the Chargers could absolutely use in the second round because you have guys that granted you need to get younger on the outside but if you can if you can create an offense that that really forces the defense to play the entire width of the field then Jatavion Sanders is a guy that can outrun eventually his play speed he outruns most coverage and he gets contested catches against smaller targets so I think Sanders is a, a highly underrated weapon of the tight end group and to me it goes Bowers is the clear one but I think Sanders is the really clear two as well yeah, I'll tell you, it's, you know, I think people get so fixated. I keep saying people, yeah, Charger fans, you know, they get fixated on, on you know, 
number five and trading down and getting all these extra picks. And we know they have eight this year. And, and I'm guessing Joe Ortiz would like to get out of here with more like 10, 11, even 12, maybe if he can figure that out. You can trade down another round. You, you can trade down from 37. Yes. If there's players sitting there that somebody wants, you can go from 37 to 48 and pick up an extra third rounder. Okay, so now you got that. Now you got two third rounders, and now you can pick up an extra fourth rounder if you, you trade down from one of those. So there are ways to do it that, that don't involve number five. Um, but let's just say that, that they're stuck. And and they're stuck, and and now we've got to figure out. You know, they just can't quite extract the value. Now, I do think there's monetary value out of this as well, and I think that may be what people are forgetting. I mentioned you stick at number five, and that four year contract is about thirty five million bucks. You trade back to to eight, and it goes from thirty five to twenty six million. You trade down to eleven, and it goes from thirty five to twenty one million. So yeah. that's going to help you out a lot. Yeah, I, I, it's just it's more than just oh, I wish we would have got an extra first next year or a second, but and I think they'll be able to. I think I think there's enough heat on these receivers. So here's what I'm getting at, Lance. How big of a jump from what they have right now to what they would be bringing in, the way you've graded the talent, right? So the offensive lineman, they have Trey Pipkins. He's got two more years on his deal. He had a rough go last year, but he played pretty well the year before. Um, new offensive line coaches, Nick Hardwick coming in, uh, Devlin coming in to, to lead that group. Obviously, you have Greg Roman, who's going to be coaching up the O-line when it comes to run blocking and trying to figure something out that they have not been able to for the last 10 plus years on the Chargers. How big of an upgrade would you see if it is one of those guys, if it's Latham, if it's Fuaga, if it's Alt from what they have right now? in in Trey Pipkins and, and knowing that you have Slater locked over there on the left side? Well, I mean, look, the the division you're in, I mean, you got to face Max Crosby, and he usually comes from that side. Right. So I think you've got to get better at right tackle. Um, I think it's a big, I think it's a big upgrade. If you, depending on certain guys, I think Fuaga is more of a pass protection upgrade. I think Joe Alt can do all of it. Is and I think for me, Latham is the top guy because Latham for me is good, not great in pass pro, but I think he's good. He's very powerful. He is an elite run blocker. I mean, he will cave you in. So you have to remember now, the running game is going to take on added significance. I know what Brandon Staley said in the past about running, but this is going to be an execution of the running game with Harbaugh, and it's and it's going to be something that he makes a focus. And so when you have a right tackle who can absolutely cave people in, Harbaugh got to see Latham play up close and personal in that playoff game. Um, I, I think – you know, I would love him at the number five spot for Jim Harbaugh. I think Harbaugh would like him, would like Alt. Uh, Fuaga is a guy who is wired right. I think most of these offensive linemen who could be considered are wired right. The problem is, Money, I don't think there's – I don't know. I mean, for me, I have Latham highest. I don't know if the Chargers would think there's a big enough difference between those top three, top four guys that they wouldn't really prioritize moving back. And I know that's right. going to be a comment a lot, but I'm not sure there's a significant break. Now, I do think there's a significant break in the wide receivers. I think when you look at Neighbors and Harrison, for me, they're the top two. Then comes Adunze, who's just under that. And I like all three of them for the Chargers. Once you get past that, though, it's it's now you've got a few more question marks about Brian Thomas Jr. Uh, love the speed, but I don't know if he's in the same category as those other guys. So when I, I think of it this way, what I like to put neighbors or Harrison Jr., what I like to try to put some pressure on Quentin Johnston and maybe, you know, the next guy up, whoever you draft, is going to be the replacement for Keenan or Mike Williams, you know, in terms of short term and then of and then of certainly long term. I think I think wide receiver gives you more bang at the number five spot than tackle does. Um, just based on quick impact relative to the Chargers offense. But to your point, you do have to factor in, well, wait a minute now. Are you going to get the same bang from them in a Jim Harbaugh offense? I would say, I would say, you know, you could make the argument no historically, but Jim Harbaugh's never had, you know, he's never had Justin Herbert thrown to people right. either. So I think he has right. to, I think what we have to figure out is how much is he going to allow Herbert to do what he does best and how much is he going to be centered on run establish the run, take more pressure off of Herbert. I think that's the unknown right now. Uh, you know, the one thing that, that we've watched year in and year out, specifically recently, so you have Justin Herbert, this incredibly talented quarterback with, uh, you know, possibly the strongest arm in the league. And 
and defenses didn't care. We, we, we saw, I wouldn't be surprised if the Chargers saw the fewest amount of heavy boxes in the league because they couldn't run the ball. Like they, they just did not, you know, they, they, they did not care. So I guess I understand like, you know, you have a lighter box because you, you want to protect from the deep pass, but this was different. They were pressing, they would creep a safety up because they just did not honor that there was going to be a enough time to get the ball downfield and B they just knew that they could stop the run with, with the lighter box. I guess that's what I'm getting at. I kind of explained it in the reverse. They, they did not need to get a heavy box to stop the run. So Justin Herbert's deep throws were prevented, you know, from being as successful because there were, there was constantly safety help. They never had to creep up in the box because these guys just could not run block. So for me, if you really want to unlock the offense, you have got to start forcing teams to get heavier in the box so Herbert can take advantage yeah. of it instead of having these guys, you know, playing off and a safety, two safeties deep. And just there was very, very limited opportunities for him to push the ball downfield. I did a poor job of explaining it, but that's I hope you kind of understand what I'm getting at. No, I absolutely understand. I mean, it, it's you have to make them respect the run game and coaches. I know it feels like an antiquated notion with fans. But really, if you love a passing game, then you have to love your running game because once you have safeties that start to creep up near the line, once one team is imposing their will, linebackers have to play different. They start running more, you know, they start running more uh, linebacker blitzes to slow down the run. You start dropping a safety in the box. All of this has an impact on the ability to take a safety out of the mix from a coverage standpoint and, and attack the field. And so, the, the really good thing that Jim Harbaugh does in that regard is it's a run play action, run play action. It's almost like the old school Shanahan type stuff, although it's more power centric from the way he, he run blocks. It's not the outside zone, but he is, he's committed to you play the run, you play off of the run in your passing game. Now, is that best for Justin Herbert? Um, maybe not statistically, maybe not in fantasy football. Is it going to be best for maybe winning more games than the Chargers have won and controlling the tempo and, and, and being able to have better fourth quarters where you close out more games and turn them into wins as opposed to close losses? Yeah, it could be because once you establish the run and you impose your will, you start to convert some of those first downs. You don't punt at the end of games giving teams a chance to break your heart. Again, I've listened to you on broadcast on the radio <laughs> yeah. many a times, and Chargers have had their hearts broken late in games. And I think that uh, you know the philosophy needs to change over there. But at the same time, well, and that's why I'm excited about the fifth pick because I just truly believe that the top twelve, the top twelve players, top fourteen players in this draft are really good and can have a big impact. And man, if you can move back, and you talked about it, money, it's not going to be impossible to move back twice. Not in this draft. Not no. coming from five. No, no. I mean, that's, you know, Brett Coleman was talking about that, the Holy Grail. Can you move from five to eight and then eight to 14, something, you know, there's, there's ways to do it because of the wide receivers and, you know, what Dallas Turner was able to do and what Mitchell was able to, you know, there's, there's going to be different positions if you're not too greedy. And, and you know, and money, something that yeah. you have to factor in. Okay. So what do people trade up for? It has to be one of the three or four most important positions, quarterback, right. rush, wide receiver, and sometimes corner. So it just so happens that, or, or, or I'm sorry, offensive tackle. So you got tackle, you've got rush, you've got quarterback, and you've got wide receiver. Right. These just happen to be four of the most important positions at the top. Not only are they important, they're loaded in the top 16 picks. So now it really gives you a great opportunity to move back because teams are going to want to trade up. They're yeah. going to want to deal. And I think one of the one of the things to remember, and we said this last week while we were out of the combine uh, about this new staff is, you know, I'm not trying to disparage their recruiting, but they weren't Ohio State, they weren't Alabama, they weren't Georgia. Now they're Michigan, and they're bringing in top twenty, top fifteen classes. But these are dudes they developed into NFL players. These are good coaches that develop talent. So it's it's all right if you don't if you decide to take that blue chip at 5 or if you decide to trade back twice to 11 and then to 16 whatever it may be i feel like this particular staff is able to do is able to accomplish what you're looking to accomplish because they have a track record of doing that if that makes sense 
Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to come from college yeah. to the pros. Like, is that an advantage for, for Jim Harbaugh? I can tell you this. Feels like it. I, it wouldn't surprise me if Harbaugh is digging around on guys like Blake Corum. It wouldn't surprise me if he said, we're going offensive tackle in the first round and we'll look at Roman Wilson in the second. And that's not always great. I'd rather you just get the best players. and You don't want to be too far in the bubble. And, unfortunately, I think coaches, when they when they come from college into the pros, they tend to go with what they know. And so I do think there's going to be players who he recruited. That's something else that's not really talked about a lot. But the other thing that you have to watch for is players, uh, coaches who recruited a player that went to another team, right. well, they, they keep that in mind too. Like that, that plays big into the draft as well. Yeah. I mean, that could be Marvin Harrison. If it goes one, two, three, four quarterbacks, sure. you know, he had to face him every year and Jim Harbaugh could say to Joe Ortiz, Hey man, this guy's a nightmare. This guy is an absolute nightmare. He tortured me. I stayed up late wondering how we were going to slow him down. Just stick and pick and let's not even think about it. So that's, that's the other thing, right? It's it sounds like just... you're on the, are you on the stick and pick team? No, I'm not okay. just because I, I have seen this team unravel because of depth issues year in and year out, Lance, you know, where Joey Bosa has really struggled to stay healthy. Um, I've, you know, we saw Rashawn Slater two years ago go down. Now, Jamari Sawyer stepped in and, and did an admirable job, but it was not a Rashawn Slater job. And, and we saw, like, that's the thing about the Jacksonville game is we all sort of marveled at how well Justin played, at, at how solid Jamari Sawyer was at left tackle, but one of the things that I think people failed to see was, no, they still couldn't run the ball. And and when they needed to win games, when they needed to have a four-minute drill, that Jacksonville game was a product, and it was, it was magnified, it was amplified. Their inability to run the ball showed up in a big way that day, as did their lack of depth at corner. Because once Mikey Davis went down and got hurt, they were done. And now Trevor Lawrence has taken advantage of them on the outside and they can't run the ball. It's three and out. They're trying to milk as much clock as they can, you know, up 27 to seven in the second half and they couldn't do anything about it. So I think that's people have to, you know, I, I think it's important to acknowledge maybe it's not just the starter, but how high of a level is, you know, is your replacement because, that, that game, to me, really amplified what has been a serious issue for this team the last few years with Justin Herbert, a quarterback, and that's it's been very hard for them to overcome injuries because of the lack of depth. Yeah, and, and the only way you build depth is by adding picks, yeah. uh, making your picks, not, not leaning on short-term free agency. And then I think most importantly, the evaluation process is – for any team that wants to build a sustainable winner, you've got to be able to draft well in rounds two through five. I mean, it's just, it's really not up for debate. You don't have to right. hit every pick, but in a year that you don't hit a fifth, next year you need to hit a fifth. And when I say hit, it can just be somebody who's quality depth on the roster and good on special teams. That's good enough. No doubt. No doubt. And that's that's something, look, Tom, Tom did a great job of pretty much nailing every one of his first round picks. And after that, there were some really solid players in the second and third round. And there were also some misses in the second and third round, like you said. So you had Thule that hit. You had Chen and Wusu that hit. But then you also had some misses, particularly on the offensive line. Dan Feeney, Forrest Lamp. Like, those are guys that are in their late 20s right now that you hit on those. And my gosh, you're feeling really good uh, about what you have up front instead of asking, okay, do we need – a center guard right tackle? Is that what we're talking about? I, I have faith that Zion's going to be okay. I, I think this this coaching staff, he's just too big. He's too strong. I've seen it in in bursts for me not to believe that Zion Johnson's not going to be okay. I, I think he's going to be fine. I, you know, Sawyer just did not make an adjustment to guard. It didn't quite work for him. It, it just it wasn't quick enough and, and just repeatedly would get beat off the jump. So I'm not sure what the, what the solution is there. They obviously need a center because Corey Lindsley's retiring. And, and right tackle, it's been a bit peaks and valleys with, with Trey. Um, Lance, I'll, I'll get you out of here on this. You mentioned running back. There's going to be a, there's a lot of free agents available. The Chargers are still, after letting go of Eric Kendricks at the time we record this, that's all that's been done. And, and there's going to be more done to, to get this number lower. I don't know how realistic spending a bunch of money on Derrick Henry or or Swift or or Saquon Barkley, you know how that is. What about the group of running backs that you saw? We heard they met with Ray Davis. Seemed like he had a really good combine. How does this group of running backs look to you? It's it's a little light. Um, I think the top running back is Jonathan Brooks, who's coming off an ACL tear, but I think he's a legitimate high second round pick in most drafts. Uh, will probably slide 
into the latter part of the second, depending on how the medicals go. Jalen Wright, I thought, really helped himself from Tennessee. Now, I like Jalen Wright. I already liked him. But uh, just running fast, when you have size and speed like that, it matters. Trey Benson had a terrific combine. I think he clearly has has, has put himself in the top three, depending on how teams take a look at that. So that's, that's more of a, a big day guy, right, Lance? selection. What's that? Trey Benson's a big guy, isn't he? Big guy, about 220 pounds, ran fast, jumps high. He just sometimes plays a little more finesse than he needs to. You want him to remember that he's big sometime and play big and not try to get too clever, especially in the NFL when the, it's much greater speed. He's going to have to learn to finish better. But once you get past uh, Marshawn Lloyd could be uh, from USC, could be a third, third into the fourth round pick. And then it becomes kind of the Ray Davis territory, which I think is – maybe late three into the mid four. There's a guy named Tyrone Tracy, who I'm a big fan of, who can run and catch. But um, there's a lot of it's just okay from a depth right. standpoint. I mentioned Blake Corum. I think he's a good backup, a good second back. Braylon Allen's got a chance to be that. Will Shipley I like is the the James Cook type, kind of a poor man's James Cook. So, uh, But it's, it's not really loaded up unless you go top three or four uh, running backs. You may not have the guy that's uh, – you know, I say that, but then again, Jim Harbaugh is like, no, we'll get two guys and we're going to start hammering people. So yeah. it, it just it takes a guy like Ray Davis. I'm looking right now. The guys who fit that mold would be uh, Marshawn. Oh, I think um, Ray Davis would really fit that. Blake Corum, uh, Braylon Allen, Cody Schrader. Like these are all guys who are going to be at the earliest late third and into the fifth round. Perfect. So it wouldn't shock me if they drafted running backs, but they did not put a a top, you know, a top a day one, day two grade on any of them. Right. Just, uh, you know, like kind of what, what Green Bay does every year. They take a receiver in the second or third round or fourth yep. round or what, just take receivers. So for Jim Harbaugh, take running backs, take, take two, whatever. Take running backs. I'm looking at Jace yeah. McClellan from Alabama. I mean, there's guys on day three you could find that could come in just like Kyron Williams did with the Rams right. and become a major factor. Uh, Lance, we know you're busy. Uh, freaking awesome. Really, really appreciate you doing this. You can follow him on Twitter at Lance Zerline, Z-I-E-R-L-E-I-N. He does it for NFL.com. All those scouting reports uh, that you click on as you prepare for the draft were written by Lance. He is uh, one of the best in the business, and we love having him. Certainly appreciate you hopping on here for a, a post-combine wrap. Lance, thank you. You got it. Thanks, buddy. All right, folks, bonus content in addition to Lance Post Combine for the wrap on what we saw out there in Indianapolis. Also had a chance to catch up with Chargers assistant general manager Chad Alexander. All right, so one of the best parts of the offseason is just getting to know the new faces around the Chargers organization. Very pleased to be joined by one of them. Assistant general manager Chad Alexander joins us now on Chargers Weekly. Chad, first and foremost, welcome to L.A., even though we're in Indy. Uh, how's the adjustment been so far? Uh, it's been great. You know what I mean? It's uh, just we, we, we've been there uh, a couple of weeks, and, and we were able to kind of hit the ground running and uh, met a lot of great people within the organization and, and started a, a round of draft meetings. It was really productive, and it's, it's, it's been awesome. You know what I mean? It's, it's, been, it's been a really good experience. So yeah. you spent a lot of time in Baltimore the last, yeah. uh, I think, half decade with, with the New York Jets. Is everything the same? You just pick up and take what you've done thus far on all these players and you go from the Jets to here and it's just kind of the same work that you've already done? Pretty much. I mean, it, it, it's a little different, obviously, for, for, for several different reasons. But um, the philosophy is, is, is pretty much the same because, you know, we, we, were, we were all kind of taught by Ozzy and, and, and came up under Ozzy. And, and uh, you know, Joe D, you know, shares that same philosophy. And obviously, uh, Hortiz does as well. So uh, it, th there, there are some differences, obviously, within each organization. But but the, the, the chemistry and the feel of it, the feel of it is the same. It really is. And it's, it's really the same process. So it's, it's, been, it's been really good. I was going to say, how seamless is it to just you, – you know Joe. You know how yeah. he operates to, oh, to yeah. come into the building. And you said he's a connector. Yeah. Uh, how has that adjustment been? Probably just like riding a bike? Uh, a little bit, yeah. There's, there's been a little bit of, of an adjustment just in terms of uh, – just with new people and, and a new organization and stuff like that. But Joe is, 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 is an awesome personnel guy. Like he, first of all, he's a great guy. You know what I mean? And then he, 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 does, he does a great job of connecting the building. He brings the energy every day. Uh, he's, uh, you know, he's really smart. He's really passionate about what he does. So um, it, it's really easy to, 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 to kind of 
to, to, to pick up and, and, and to move and, and, and under Joe. He, he does a great job of connecting the building, and, and as a leader, he does a great job. So it, it, it's been, I wouldn't say seamless, because, you know, there's obviously, you know, you got to grind. you gotta, you got to yeah. work at it, and you got you got to be there for a long time. you got to figure things out and figure, figure out the processes and how people do things within the organization. But at the same time, it's been... It's been awesome. It's been a lot of fun. You know what I mean? It's been, it's, like I said, great, great people within the Chargers organization, really talented people uh, that, that want to win. So that, 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 that's, what's made it, that's what's made it a lot of fun. You yeah. mentioned Ozzy. Ozzy Newsom, arguably, you know, in the conversation, is the, the best front office executive in the history of the league. Without, I, I guess, I don't think you'll be giving up any state secrets here, but <laughs> you said it, it's all kind of similar. Yeah. What, it, it what really made is. Baltimore so good and consistent for so many years in uh, team building? I, yeah, I think it was, it was just, you know, the culture. It, you know, the culture matters most anywhere you go. It's, it's the people. It's the quality of the people within the organization. And, like I said, everybody wants to feel uh, like, like like they're invested, and you know, it, it's really just it's the trust that, that that everyone has for each other, and the the accountability. Everyone holds each other accountable, and I would say that Ozzy is just he's 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 really really good in terms of consistency, in terms of uh, you know trusting the process, believing in the process. I've never really seen him you know rattled in any situation, some high pressure situations. Man, he he is he he is he's the best, and and I really think that. You know, he was obviously a Hall of Fame player, but but really feel like he, he's a Hall of Fame executive, yeah. definitely as well. So, and, and, you know, couldn't ask for a better situation or, or a better guy to learn under. Chad, your your thoughts on this roster as currently constructed? Obviously, the Chargers were out in, in New York this year for a Monday Night Football game, yeah. and uh, a lot of moving parts, a lot of decisions yeah. that need to be made. But just you know, first glance, your thoughts on this roster? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, uh, first glance, you know, you, you take a look at the, the quarterback. You know, it's just uh, he, he's a great player and. A great competitor, and, and it, you know we're, we're, we're lucky to, to, to land at a, I'm, lu- I'm lucky to land at a place that, that that's got a, a great player at that position like that. You know what I mean? A young guy who uh, is, is a big guy. He's you know six six. He's got a rocket arm. He's really tough, and he's really really smart as well. So I mean you know that that you know it all starts with that, and then and then there's there's some other great pieces on the roster as well. Obviously, you know what I mean. So so yeah, it's 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 a, it's a good situation definitely. We uh, we kind of heard from everyone that that had their press conferences uh, starting with you know coach Harbaugh then with with Joe Ortiz and now with Greg Roman running game physical attack at the at the the line of scrimmage that's something that you obviously did in in Baltimore for a number of years absolutely is that premium picks is it like what what's the best way to make sure that that those fronts are as good as they can be how do you how do you build it well I mean yeah I mean you you build it you want to make sure Obviously, that 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 you, that you build it, you know, through the trenches. You know what I mean. The O line and D line, strong, strong run game, uh, ability to stop the run, and 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 you know we have a, we have a great coach who who's done that everywhere he's been in uh, Jim Harbaugh. So, you know, the same philosophy that, that his brother John has uh, with, with the Ravens, and you know, it's uh you know I really feel like you know all 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 of the all it used to be just the left tackle position was was considered a premium position or, or you know for for uh, for the old line but I really feel like all the offensive line positions are premium positions and so that that's really important to be, to be able to build that up and and to, to create the type of identity that you want to create with the physicality and the run game and, and, and that type of stuff so yeah you, you, you know I think about the Jets and yeah. obviously you were there for the last half decade and I, you know I remember when when we were going through it and Elijah Vera Tucker was a very real possibility. Slater ends up sliding. You yeah. end up getting one of the best left tackles. But Absolutely. maybe if you can build on that, because we know there's some really good centers in right. this draft. There's some really good guards. So oh, yeah. how has that changed in the last le- – and when did it change where you were willing to invest those premium picks and those interior linemen? Well, yeah, you know, that, that, that's a good question. Um, I think it kind of just evolved with, uh, you know – everything starts with the quarterback. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's about protecting the quarterback. And, and some, a lot of quarterbacks, you know, obviously want their blind side protected and, and the edge is protected. But there's a, a lot of quarterbacks that, that prefer, like, that middle, that the interior O-line to be the most firm part of the of the O-line. And, and so, you know, it, it's you, you got you got to make sure that all five are, are really, really, really good, really smart. Um, you know, it's versatility in there, you know, adds to their value, being able to play, you know, multiple different positions. But, um, yeah, I, I think I think it's 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 definitely become you know uh, all the positions on the O line have become premium positions. Chad, how important was it to work with John 
now working with Jim, knowing that they do have the same philosophy because, of course, the front office has got to be in lockstep with the head coach. And, yes. you know, Sala may be different from Jim, and Jim is, you know, similar to John, but maybe a little bit different. But having that experience with John, how, how beneficial is that for you guys moving forward? I think I think it's great. I mean, I, you know, I, I'd never really uh, – I'd met Jim in passing and stuff like that, but I didn't, didn't really know him. And obviously worked with John for years, and, and they're very similar. You know what I mean? They're, they're all about ball, which is, you know, you, you can't ask for anything more as a, as a personnel guy, you know what I mean, to come in. And, you know, Jim, he, he's, I think he does a great job of, of connecting the building. He does a great job of, you know, building relationships and, and having those discussions. He asks really good questions, and he's really smart. He's got a great sense of humor. And so, it, it's you know, so far it's been, it's been awesome, you know, just working with him and being around him. And, and, and starting to understand the, the stuff that he, he appreciates and he likes. But, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really about toughness. It's about, you know, it's about the culture. It's about, you know, running the ball, building a strong offensive line. And, and, and both of those brothers uh, definitely, definitely share that, that philosophy. When it comes to kind of getting ready for, you know, the, the campaign that, that'll start, you know, with training camp and then obviously when games get going, first thing that comes up is cap compliance. Second yeah. thing that comes up, free agency. And, and oh, yeah. then the draft just kind of – I don't know if it's general philosophy or, or what you've sort of subscribed to your whole career. Is there a right way, you know, especially when you come in yeah. and you're trying to change a culture and you're trying to establish something? Is it free agency? Is it making sure the roster is right? Is it the draft? Like, what's the best, what's the right way to build this thing? We've always kind of believed that the draft is like the bloodline of your organization and, and it's the most cost-effective form to, to, to build your team. And, and so it's, uh, you know, it, it probably starts with the draft, I would say. You know what I mean? But, but there, it's, like you say, there's a lot of moving parts. You know, there's free agency. There's, you know, undrafted free agency. There's, there's trade possibilities. There's, you know, guy, getting guys that are cap cuts and stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's uh, you have to, ca you know, kind of cast a wide net. But, but it's, uh, it's pretty much all encompassing. Like, it's all the parts, you know, that are, that are moving at one time. But just being able to, to try to build the roster to the best of your ability and, and, uh, and, and bring the right people in, you know, the, the right players definitely, but, but you want to you make sure you, you bring the right people in, you know, in terms of, uh, in terms of the players. Is it a bit of an advantage, the, the fact that Jim is coming from the Big Ten, and there's 18 Michigan guys here, there's yeah. a ton of Big Ten pro top prospects that yeah. he probably has thoughts on, intel oh, yeah. on, that you guys can collaborate and talk about? Oh, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's a huge advantage. I mean, he, he has intimate knowledge of, of all those Michigan guys, and as, as well as everybody from the staff that, that came from Michigan. So that's a huge advantage for us, and, you know, they're a great team, and, and, they, and you know, obviously they won it all, and they got a lot of representation here in Indy, and they, they've all earned it, so – it's uh yeah that that's that, that's a, that's an advantage definitely. I would assume you know we see it. There's certain teams that draft guys from certain schools. Yeah, um, you right. know for whatever reason there's there's just a connection there. As someone that has been evaluating these Michigan players, what can you say about just sort of what you saw happen there and the development and and what they were putting in, into the draft year after year? Yeah, just I mean just you know extremely consistent in terms of the type of individuals that they that they you know put out every year from on a year to year basis. You know they're going to be tough. You know they're going to be extremely competitive. You know they're going to be you know great teammates, and you know they're going to be really smart. You know so it's uh, it, it it you know that as a basis because if they if they weren't that they wouldn't be playing in Michigan. You know so it, that that's. That's an advantage, you know, definitely coming out of, coming out of that, those, you know, that, that type of program and, and coming, coming to our level, you know what I mean? It, it, it makes it almost a, a little bit of a seamless transition for them, you know, so, and, and they, they've had a lot of success. So, so yeah, that's, uh, that, that, they're, they're a great program, great program. Chad, this is a tough business, man. It, it, it's, a, it's a small, tight-knit fraternity, uh, coaches, GMs, scouts, just – the fact that you're here now, how would you describe this process for you, knowing that you're now going to be teamed up with Joe in L.A. and yeah. in a brand new role? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really exciting, man. I'm, I'm just, you know, really pumped about the opportunity. You know, I'm psyched about it, you know. And uh, like I said, we, we've tried to hit the ground running. And, and, you know, there's a lot of great people, a lot of talented individuals in the Chargers organization. So just working collaboratively with them. And, you know, Joe is, like I said, Joe's a great leader. He understands that, that the best decisions – mostly come through discussion, you know what I mean? And, and being collaborative and, and everyone, you know, kind of coming to a cumulative uh, a, a decision. And it's not about, you know, who makes the decision. It's not about who's right. It's about being right as an organization. So um, that, that, that's that, that's the cool part about it, you know. And, and and that was the same way with Joe D. It was the same way with Ozzy and those guys. They, it, it's, and, and, and Eric DaCosta. It's really – it's uh, they, they don't ask – anything from people that work under them that, 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 that they don't bring to the table every day themselves you know what i mean they're extremely passionate uh they're versatile they're humble they're loyal 
they're smart and uh, you know and, and, and they're, they're able to uh, to build trust you know what I mean trust is it's a tough thing to, it's a hard thing to develop but it's easy to lose you know what I mean and and, and those guys have proven through their leadership that, that they're able to able to navigate it well going back to what you were talking about with the uh, the Michigan players have you figured out I assume you know you patent it and sell it if you if you could figure it out Football's tough. Yeah. I mean, you've got to be tough to play football. You Absolutely. Know, you know, put on a plastic outfit and run into guys that are right. you know, twice your size. But right. have you figured out how to find toughness, how to find those you know, guys that love football? Is like, yeah. how, do you, how do you figure that out? It, you know, I think, I think here at the Combine is a great opportunity to just get to know players, you know what I mean, to get to know their story, to know their, their background, their history. There's a lot of talented guys here from – a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different situations, and uh, you get to really figure out their, their love of the game, you know. And, and, and it's also, you know, when you go into the school during the fall and make the school calls and, and, and get the background, you know, from, from the sources, and, you know, a lot, a lot of times you, you can find out that way as well. But, but yeah, it's tough, you know what I mean? It's, uh, it's, not, a, it's not an exact science, but, uh, but, but if you're able to kind of read people and understand, uh, you know, what makes them tick, it, it makes it a little easier, you know. Yeah. As, can I ask um – it's changed now because yeah. we have access to everything. We can see everything. Every game is televised. You can get film on everything. But I remember um, doing a doing a Oregon State game and was talking to Mike Riley, and we were talking about Quiz Rogers, and he yeah. told the story of he's like, you know, I, I had no idea who Quiz was. I went uh -huh. to get James, right. and when I went to get James, they were like, oh, you're gonna see his brother. You see his brother. And <laughs> in that yeah. moment, I offered both of them because right. I knew nobody else knew who Quiz was. Yeah. Do you have any – can you think of, like, some of those when you showed up at a – maybe it's a small school uh, and you're scouting someone and then you end yeah. up kind of stumbling into somebody else? Uh, well, no, I mean, Jacoby Jones is a story that I remember definitely because, you know, he was at Lane. And, uh, you know, you go there and they practice at night and, and shoot, um, you know, no lights or anything like right. that. And he's out there grabbing everything. And, and, and so, you know, he, he was a guy that kind of stands out yeah. from that standpoint. Uh, but, uh, but, yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, every, every year you, there are guys that – that pop up, you know, kind of out of nowhere, but but you know, we'll we'll we'll, we'll find them. They'll, they'll exactly. get on. Our, they'll definitely get on our radar. Our radar, one way or another. You know. Listen, I know it's full speed ahead with work, but hey, you're out in Los Angeles now. What are you most looking forward to with the family and getting yeah. out to LA? Uh, you know, yeah, I haven't really uh, had an opportunity to uh, to spend much time, you know, hanging out or anything like that. But just you know, the weather. You know, you can't beat it. You <laughs> know what I mean? Just being being in the Northeast for the most part throughout uh, most of my career, and now you know. Coming out to coming out to sunny California, it's uh, it's beautiful. You know, it's been raining for the past couple of weeks. You know, yeah, but that'll change. Yeah, it'll change. I heard. I heard exactly. this is the rainy season. So, but uh, but yeah, definitely, definitely looking forward to that and just just hanging out and you know looking forward to the kids coming out and, and, and enjoying that as well. There you go. Yeah. You got it right here. I can oh, yeah. see the uh, the beach with yeah. the umbrella. <laughs> yeah, <on there. laughs> no it's doubt. Like Jets ready. Yeah, exactly. yeah, no <laughs> doubt. Yeah, try to bring the powder blue too. So. There we go. <laughs> well, uh, congratulations. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I appreciate your time, man. Thank you. Thank you. So that'll do it, our post-combine edition of Chargers Weekly. Remember, next week, this team is going to probably look drastically different when we do this on Thursday. The beginning of the league year is Wednesday, March 13th. Already saw Eric Kendricks uh, let go, and you're going to have some redone contracts, some trades, some um, movement, uh, maybe re outright release, but there are going to be a number of things that are done between now and and when we start this pod a week from today, because Wednesday, March 13th, 4 p.m. Eastern, beginning of the league year. So keep your eyes on all the Chargers social media spots to keep up to speed with everything that's going on in this constantly changing landscape of a Chargers roster with all these new folks in the front office. Hey.